You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Tuesday 30th of September 2014. Woman raped by Asian in Sunderland's Mowbray Park. Fake Newcastle cabbie kidnaps young reveller before sexually abusing her. Peterborough's Mohammed Abbas jail for sex with underage girl. Older woman implores, deport beast who raped me, please. Have you ever heard of Rotherham's James Cole? You should have. He reported the crimes in 2005. This tiny country produces five times as many Islamic State fighters per capita as Turkey. Ukraine crisis hits gas prices in Italy. Oettinger blames celebs for nude photo hack. Hong Kong protesters and China dig in. Thought for the day, crisis BMP, what to believe. And finally, 50 years ago, food we used to eat. Now, I have another announcement to make on the days we will be on air. We at Radio Britain are not buggering about just for the sake of it. We are free now to test various days and times, and we have kept a close eye on numbers. Now, to keep ourselves to two days a week is good for the moment, as although we have a few UK reporters, our main European one is ill and indeed has been in hospital in France for the last couple of months. Get well, I'm no kafar, we miss you. So we've shifted the two days we are doing from Tuesdays and Thursdays to Mondays and Fridays. This means that at least two days will be on the previous three days, but not Wednesday. This gives a weekend for Monday news and four days until the Friday news. And we can still have interviews on Friday as per usual. This format will start this coming Friday. UK News. Woman raped by Asian in Sunderland's Mowbray Park. Police are appealing for witnesses after a woman was raped in a Sunderland park. The incident happened between 4.30pm and 5.30pm in the evening on Monday, September 22nd in Mowbray Park in the city centre. The woman, aged in her 40s, was in the park when she was approached by a man who attacked her. He is described as Asian, aged in his 20s. Officers are carrying out inquiries into the attack and are appealing for any witnesses and anyone who was in the park on Monday evening to contact them. It's thought that around the time of the attack, a man who had a beard and a woman were walking in the park and officers are keen to speak to them as potential witnesses. Police are carrying out extra patrols throughout the park and surrounding area. World at eight. If the witnesses are Asian, not a hope. Fake Newcastle cabbie kidnapped young reveller before sexually abusing her. Businessman Mohammed Malik is facing years behind bars after he kidnapped and molested a 20-year-old who thought he was a taxi driver. As she was a stranger to Newcastle, she didn't realise she was only 200 yards from the place where her and her friends were staying. She was unsuccessful in trying to hail a taxi outside Sinner's Bar and so started walking towards the Haymarket up Newgate Street. Stalking the streets looking for a victim, the businessman is caught on CCTV picking up a drunk 20-year-old who thought he was a taxi driver. The victim got into Malik's car near the gate complex on Newgate Street and asked to be taken to the short distance to the place in the city centre where she was staying with friends. But instead, Malik drove her to the west end of Newcastle, parked up in a secluded spot and subjected the terrified young woman to a sordid sex attack. He was snared after three men who spotted the woman getting into the car, noted down the registration number and texted it to the police. Now the 30-year-old of Beaconsfield Street, Arthurs Hill, Newcastle, is facing years in prison after a jury at Newcastle Crown Court convicted him of kidnap and sexual assault. Judge John Milford told him, Doubtless you have been warned as to the sort of sentence you are likely to receive in terms of years. World at eight. Why not deportation for him and his family? Why this keeping them all over here and feeding them for years? He is a criminal and a foreign criminal at that, although this goes on in their home countries all the time. Peterborough's Mohammed Abbas jailed for sex with underage girl. Mohammed Abbas, 30, groomed the girl when she was 12 years old and took her to a park where he tried to have sex with her. He would drive her around in his black BMW and take her to houses for sex. She would often not return home for several days. 
The offences came to light as part of Operation Earl, a joint inquiry by Cambridgeshire Constabulary and the Peterborough City Council into child sexual exploitation. The victim was identified during another investigation. Abbas, previously of Gladstone Street, Peterborough, initially went on trial in June. However, a jury at Peterborough, Crown Court, failed to reach a verdict. A retrial started and he was convicted of two counts of sexual assault on a girl under 13 by penetration and two specimen charges of sexual activity with a child. He was sentenced to 12 years for the sexual assault charges and eight for the sexual activity to run concurrently. He will be deported after serving his sentence. World at eight. And all his stinking community as well, I hope. Olden woman implores deport beast who raped me, please. An olden woman is fighting to get an immigrant who raped her when she was 12 years old, deported. Samantha Roberts, now 20, was horrified when her rapist, Shaquille Chowdhury, was sentenced to only six years in October 2007. Chowdhury, 39 at the time, served only three years before his release on licence. He was found guilty of luring Miss Roberts into a car on Manchester Road in October 2006 before taking her back to his home and subjecting her to a sickening ordeal at the hands of himself and others. Miss Roberts and her partner and lawyer, Stephen Walker, want to see Chowdhury deported to his native Bangladesh. Chowdhury gained British citizenship in 2004, but the Home Office has the authority to deprive him of this in the interest of the public. World at eight. But they won't, will they? Have you heard of Rotherham's James Cole? You should have. He reported the crimes in 2005. From an American blog, Vice.com, in the centre of Rotherham, England, is the Interchange, a modern glass concourse that serves as the nexus for the buses, taxis and trains that crisscross the town. Rotherham's sex gangs used the Interchange to recruit victims and transport them to waiting clients. According to the Alexis J report, which said 1,400 young girls were abused over a period of 16 years within the well-lit and sterile corridors of the interchange. School children ran a gauntlet of drug dealers, addicts and people involved in a range of criminal activity. The C block is where the buses to the villages go. Very, very few people use that part of the interchange, said victim Emma Jackson. It's always very quiet. The deserted terminal provided the perfect hunting ground for predatory sex gangs. Emma claims that in 2003 she was sexually assaulted on C-Block, gang-raped and then sold for sex. Eventually she broke down, told her family and gave a statement to the police. She gave them a collection of seamen stained bloody clothes that she had been too ashamed to even wash. However, this important evidence was lost, somewhere on the way from Emma's home to the police station. Eventually the police gave Emma £140, $230, for her ruined clothes. A second allegation of rape led nowhere as the Crown Prosecution Service decided there wasn't enough evidence to proceed with the case. All of this was unknown to James Cole, who was 19 years old at the time and had just started working at the interchange as a security officer. The police didn't bother to ask if he'd seen anything suspicious the night Emma was first raped or to tell him to be on the lookout in the future. But by 2005, Cole was well aware that there was something disturbing taking place around the town centre, in the bus station, marketplace and surrounding deserted alleyways. He said that Asian lads were taking advantage using young teenage girls for sex. The girls were being passed around, but it seemed almost as though it was a collective agreement that this was what would happen. Added Cole, I got the impression that they enjoyed terrorising the girls. Lot of verbal abuse, name-calling, slag, bitch, demands for oral sex, spitting at them. Girls would come to us and say they were being followed. There is a permanent sadness in Cole's eyes which often fill with tears as he describes his experiences. The impact on me has been massive, he says. He pauses and takes a deep breath, hangs his head and his voice drops to a hesitant whisper. It destroyed me in a sense. Seeing the assaults, the abuse and the cavalier manner in which these men got away with this, it's tarnished and almost burnt a hole in my soul. They were just allowed to act like hyenas in a chicken hut. Cole says that throughout 2005, large groups of drug dealers and grooming gangs fought it out on the platforms. He reported incidents to the police and the South Yorkshire Transport Executive, but, he says, whatever I reported went into a black hole. His bosses asked him to draft a child protection policy for the interchange, which he did, but it gathered dust in a drawer. In February 2006, a serious assault on Lorraine, a 16-year-old girl, sickened Cole. 
He filed a witness statement to the police that claimed an Asian man had tried to force Loren to give oral sex to one of the gang and she had refused. He recalled she spat in his face and he ordered the gang to assault her in retaliation. Loren was beaten senseless. According to the report, she was cornered between a marble screen and revolving door by four Asian men and a white man. She had no escape. As one punched her in the face, another was kicking her in the body. When the first two had finished, the white male went in and punched her in the face and threw her to the floor. Another man dragged Loren off the floor and sent her crashing down again, rendering her unconscious. He then stamped on her face. Another man then entered the fray and continued to kick and punch the motionless young girl. Cole said, I thought they were going to kill her. We had it all on CCTV and it was very, very clear. I begged her to speak to the police who arrived at the scene 45 minutes later. Lorenz's attackers were all known to the cops and security staff, yet no prosecutions followed. Cole says that months after the incident occurred, police returned to the recording to the CCT operator who had accidentally dropped it and stood on it, destroying the important evidence of the gang's activities. In August 2010, the interchange suspended Cole after he made a complaint about the conduct of police at the interchange. His employers offered him an out-of-court settlement, which he decided to accept and move on without seeking legal actual against them. A few months later, in November 2010, Cole was reading his local paper, The Doncaster Star, over lunch. World date. So, as both Nick G and I have said for years, this has been going on and no one has done anything about it. And even now, despite the so-called resignations, nothing will change until the British people change and stop putting up with it. The full story by Anne Zernick and Peter Sawyer, and there is much more to it, is found at http colon forward slash forward slash www dot vice dot com forward slash read forward slash Rotherham dash grooming dash security dash guard dash and dash victims dash interview dash oh nine one. European news. This tiny country produces five times as many Islamic State fighters per capita as Turkey. As 46 members of the radical Islamic group Sharia for Belgium went on trial Monday, accused of recruiting Belgian fighters for the Islamic State's war in Syria and Iraq, a simple question was on the world's mind. Since when was Belgium such a hotbed of bellicose Islam? The nation of 11 million people has a reputation for being small and peaceful, more likely to be invaded than to do serious fighting. As Dave Barry once put it, Belgium is the screen door of Europe that Germany and France always slam on the way to fight one another. Yet as the Wall Street Journal reported Monday, Belgium is the sixth largest total European contributor of fighters for the Islamic State, with an estimated 300 Belgians having fought in Syria or Iraq. But Belgium's total population is tiny compared to the other big countries on that list. And when the numbers are adjusted for total population size, the difference between Belgium and the rest becomes stark. While roughly five out of every one million people in Germany, Turkey and Russia go to fight for jihad abroad, and nearly ten out of every one million for France and the UK, a whopping 27 out of every one million Belgian citizens is estimated to have fought in Iraq or Syria. So why is Belgium such a fertile breeding ground of jihad-ready discontent? World at eight, because it's full of wall-to-wall -wall Muslims, as the Belgians are so bloody liberal and weak. Ukraine crisis hits gas prices in Italy. The conflict in Ukraine will leave gas prices to rise in Italy this winter, the National Energy Authority has said. Gas prices will jump 5.4% in the last quarter of 2014, Italy's Energy Authority said on Monday. The price hike is due to the Russia-Ukraine crisis, in addition to a seasonal wait for raw materials, the authority said. Around 30% of Europe's gas supply comes from Russia, half of which is transported through Ukraine. The increase in gas prices is the largest in three years, since a 5.5% jump in the fourth quarter of 2011. Prices, however, dropped by 6.3% in the third quarter and fell 3.8% in the second quarter of 2014, meaning that overall Italians will be better off this year. In addition to a rise in gas prices, Italians will also spend an estimated 1.7% more on electricity between October and December. (laughs) 
Oettinger blames celebs for nude photo hack. German newspapers on Tuesday ridiculed incoming EU Digital Commissioner Gunther Oettinger after he blamed stupid celebrities for having their private nude pictures hacked and spread online. A trove of revealing selfies and other images of stars and models have been snatched from Apple's iCloud and posted online in recent weeks in what the, giant, in what the tech giant has called a targeted attack. Oettinger, German's, Germany's EU commissioner, was asked about the scandal in a Brussels hearing. He replied, if a celebrity is stupid enough to take a nude photo of themselves and put it on the internet, then they can't expect us to protect them. There's a limit to how far you can protect people against their own stupidity, he said on Monday. News site Spiegel Online said the comments show that the 60-year-old, who currently holds the Energy Commissioner's post, has not understood the affair about hacked celebrity images and judged that the new post may be too challenging for him. It pointed out the encrypted images files are automatically sent by smartphones into the data cloud as a backup and that the images were stolen by criminals. Spiegel Online added that Oettinger's comment reflected the notion that if you use the internet, you have yourself to blame. The hamburger Abent Blatt also called the comment a faux pas, while Business Daily Handles Blatt said the reply showed that Oettinger lacked the required technical expertise on online privacy protection. Well, to date, Oettinger is right. Everyone has a responsibility towards themselves. You can't expect a state or government to act like a nanny state or a handkerchief when someone has been just plain stupid. World News Hong Kong protesters and China dig in. A standoff between China and protesters in Hong Kong is deepening as pro-democracy demonstrations continued for a fifth day. Neither side is showing any signs of backing down, even as China prepares to mark its National Day on Wednesday. Hong Kong's chief executive Lung Chang Ying said on Tuesday that the pro-democracy protests on the city's streets wouldn't change China's mind as tens of thousands of demonstrators extended a blockade of the territory. In a short statement, the Occupy Central Group said it will announce plans for its next stage of civil disobedience on Wednesday if Lung does not meet their demands for democratic reform, including true universal elections, by October the 1st and Lung's resignation. Lung said he would not give in to the protesters' demands for his resignation or for greater democratic reforms. However, Lung called on the Occupy Central Movement to end the five days old protests because they have gotten out of control. He called the protests illegal but said he expected them to last for a long time. He also told the protesters that demonstrating would do nothing to shake Beijing's resolve. World date. Fine. How can we help Hong Kong? We should never have handed over. But we daren't await the sleeping dragon. Just keep taking all the crap they send us and we keep sending them money. Stop Chinese imports. Now that would be a start. We are just as weak as the air pilots we send out to bomb ISIS and they come back because they can't find them. Bloody ridiculous. Thought for the day. Crisis BMP. What to believe? Well, this is a fine pickle we find ourselves in it, Ollie. Scratch of head and a quick re-look at the flurry of emails. Now, what I'm about to say might put me in the new naughty corner of the party, but I'm used to that. The Wigton Soviet have invented a new form of punishment for officials or activists who rattle their flimsy cage. It is called the Conduct Committee and has awesome powers. This particular bit of flimsy was sent out yesterday by the chairman's PA, which I couldn't work out whether it stood for piss artist or personal assistant, but suffice this person has no name and only goes under the signature of Adam Walker. So he must be doing two acting jobs, which is clever from a guy who can barely do one job at a time. The guys on that committee should be pilloried and or ashamed, and as Barnett is the secretary of that committee, perhaps a cloth cap and a couple of whippets down his drawers should get the process moving along very nicely, thank you. I do hope they provide the relevant shade of puce for the auto de fe pointy hats, which I've always fancied wearing actually, although the singeing of my private parts I'm not so keen on. So now we have in the BMP for the first time a conduct committee, which is a waste of time as we all know that if one strays from the path of righteousness, it is out foul spot, on the spot. Now if you, like me, are heartily sick and tired of it all, then gather round and I will try to explain in layman's terms what has happened. I cannot go into the legal details because unlike Nick G, I have only worked in legal offices not trained as a legal. So allow me to put it in simple terms and miss out the unnecessary bits. 
Just take it from me that the EC meeting which resulted in NG's supposed resignation was not only illegal but pre-planned well before that meeting. After about eight hours of bullying and yelling, the deed was done, and to say there were only about four people in that meeting who did not know what was supposed to happen is true. We voted just to get the whole miserable business over and done with. It was the worst meeting I've ever attended, both in and out of either the corporate or political arenas. But that is done and dusted. And the acting chairman has stated there will be no immediate EC or EGM meeting and no immediate internal elections for either bona fide chairman or deputy chairman. In fact, a certain non-member but very well-paid hanger-on when NG was in Europe has rewritten certain sections of the Constitution to reflect this lack of action and make it virtually illegal to even request such meetings or elections, thus obviating the need for the acting chairman to actually act at all. The sad fact is that the BNP is now officially run by four party members who pull the strings of the acting chairman, but in truth it is a party run by two non-party members, Postman Pat and his financial heavy Frank the Fingers. Now we come to the emailing factor, and this is where the Conduct Committee comes into its own. EC members who have queries or genuine concerns must not contact each other in a round-robin type email. Why? If one is a normal voting member, one can email who the hell one wants to about anything. Except do not use the bmp.org UK address because they can and are read by Barnett and Co, who, as Jefferson said, have a good laugh about them. I would say this is an infringement of a right that even nationalists have, that of free speech within the party, and not, of course, for Facebook or Twitter, but as we know, everything ends up there in the end. Having had a look at the two most important emails to come out in the last days, I would say that the main point of the BMP being investigated by the official receivers is the most important one, and the one which in the reply from, as usual now, the chairman's invisible PA, have missed or mislaid the main point of that missive from NG entirely. Now, whether this was intentional to blindside the average member or an official, I don't know, but I will try to help in that respect. NG went bankrupt and it's done and dusted. The point that this PA is missing is that if NG had not been chairman of the BNP, he would not have gone bankrupt personally. It was his fighting the Muslim sexual grooming and the EHRC that piled up the legal fees and more. NG is not trying to get money back from the party, but merely warning of what could and may happen if certain people do not come clean or do what is necessary to curtail the possible damage. It really is a no-fault thing. What has happened has happened, and there's no going back. But if the party want to look to continuing to grow the BMP, then they will have to address certain unpalatable things. It matters not a row of beans whether Jackie Griffin works or what house the Griffin family live in or how they manage during the EU years. I know for a fact that if Jackie had not been working most of her married life, there will be no BMP. NG is the first to admit that it is Jackie who has been carrying the party for some years by helping Nick succeed, not the people busy taking everything they can get and thinking it is right. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, and it is the powers that be that are yelling now loudest about the lack of money now that NG is out of the EU. Their little pot of gold has gone, and every single one of them has cashed in over the last five years onto the EU and various works which have paid very well, thank you, whilst they've been running the party into the ground. Now that pot of gold is no longer there, and with the usual lack of manners and consideration, they are killing the goose that laid this particular golden egg. Talk about hitting a man when he's down. Now I am an NG supporter, but he has made mistakes as we all do. But the worst must be trusting the coterie that are now in power, and have turned on him like a pack of ravening wolves. Postman Pat and his wife earned thousands a year working in the EU, as indeed did others working for bronze when being paid for by Griffin. How's that for a turnaround? But all that is gone now, and don't we all know about it? The official receivers have every right to approach the BMP, as NG was chairman of the party during his bankruptcy proceedings, and these proceedings were party-oriented. Now, his financial demise is done and gone. These receivers have the right to investigate to see if there's any more money they can get. It has nothing to do with personal or impersonal bankruptcy proceedings. That has now finished and a new stage might well begin. NG has tried for many weeks to get Jefferson and Hogarth to speak to him about these proceedings should they occur. 
It isn't NG's fault at all, and it doesn't warrant the personal attacks he has received on various emails from the chairman's piss artist. True, he may be suffering sour grapes, as frankly I would be seething if a political party I had worked so hard for turned on me just because I was no longer officiating at the ceremony of the golden calf, but that appears to be the nature of the beast. But this possibility does not interfere with his legal acumen and knowledge of what the party could go through and how to avoid or liaise with it. But we all know by now that if anyone, and I mean anyone, tries to organise, liaise or communicate with the Wigton Soviet, it means they are trying to destroy the party or are unhappy with the way things have gone. True. But all I know is that when I joined ten years ago, although communications were still bloody awful, there was still a freedom of speech between officials that could be undertaken without censoring and nastiness. I have the awful feeling whenever I see a bulletin come through stating just how many more people have joined now that of course NG is no longer the chairman, or what breath of life the new acting chairman has blown into the party, or that the one particular new bracket, none member at the time, close bracket, official that Walker appointed in the South West without the knowledge of that RO, has now become the new Mecca after 40 years in the sodding wilderness. The party publicity guy Wyeth must be working overtime for him if one can call working a bunch of lies and wind that come blowing out from the north at monotonous intervals propaganda, and which should be renamed crapaganda because that is where I file them in the BMP crap file. Now I'm still a nationalist, and still in the party for now, but I wish that the storms of fear would not cloud a relatively simple issue which could be cleared up without all the fuss and bother it will entail in the end. Help is there to solve this problem, and slanging the helper off and being in denial is not going to help the party at all, and in fact may well herald the end of the BNP, but the beginning of the Wigton Soviet. Official receivers are just that. They receive, and they are entitled to do so. The legal status of members or EC members I'm not sure about, as I'm not well acquainted with UK corporate law, but at least I know it exists, and I can spell it. The time may well come for some people to know that denial is not a river in Africa, and the past is past. It is time for the acting chairman, who for me is not a legal entity at all until elected by the voting members of the BNP in an open and above board, not in a closed EC meeting, to actually act instead of reading his lines or putting his name to emails from his PA. Remember, only cowards blame someone who is no longer in power because that gives the cowards the opportunity of doing or seeing nothing until it is too late, and then they plead ignorance of the whole matter. Be warned. I heard Jefferson say once, do the unexpected. People never expect that. And finally, the food we ate in the 50s. Nostalgia, nostalgia, nostalgia. Eating in the UK in the 50s. Pasta had not been invented. Curry was a surname. A takeaway was a mathematical problem. A pizza was something to do with a leaning tower. Bananas and oranges only appeared at Christmas time. All crisps were plain. The only choice we had was whether to put the salt on or not. A Chinese chippy was a foreign carpenter. Rice was a milk pudding and never ever part of our dinner. A Big Mac was what we wore when it was raining. Brown bread was something only the poor people ate. Oil was for lubricating, fat was for cooking. Tea was made in a teapot using tea leaves and never green. Coffee was camp and it came in a bottle. Cubed sugar was regarded as posh. Only Heinz made beans. Fish didn't have fingers in those days. Eating raw fish was called poverty, not sushi. None of us had ever heard of yoghurt. Healthy food consisted of anything edible. People who didn't peel potatoes were regarded as lazy. Indian restaurants were found only in India. Cooking outside was called camping. Seaweed was not a recognised food. Kebab was not even a word, never mind a food. Sugar enjoyed a good press in those days and was regarded as being white gold. Prunes were medicinal. Surprisingly, muesli was readily available. It was called cattle feed. Pineapples came in chunks in a tin. We, only ever s <laughs> we had only ever seen a picture of a real one. Water came out of a tap. If someone had suggested bottling it and charging more than petrol for it, they would have become a laughing stock. The one thing that we never, ever had on our tables in the 50s was elbows. 
May I add that if food went a bit mouldy, we cut off that bit, put it in the pig bin and let the rest. No daft sell-by dates. Our mothers use common sense. I can only disagree with the coffee. My mother never bought it, as it was expensive from the proper coffee shops that used to sell it, and the smell wafted down the street. Lovely. And may I add we had shops for different things. Green grocers for fruit and veg. Grocers for hard stuffs. Butchers for meat and bacon products. Fishmongers for fish. Cobblers for shoes. Dress shops for ladies and men's shops for men and children's shops for children. Chemists for shampoo and medicines, hardware shops for hardware, garden shops for plants and flower shops for flowers. Streets were full of shoppers in those days and all of which were truly British, not what passes today for a Brit. Life was harder but simpler and people knew how to enjoy themselves in an adult way without getting blind drunk and puking in the streets. It wasn't a sin to smoke or enjoy yourself or tell a risque joke. But how times are allowed to change under the name of progress. Nostal nostalgia, oh dear me, nostalgia. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>